Welcome to another episode of One on One with Mitch LaFon. Joining me this week, drummer Ken Mary, having played with Alice Cooper, Impella Terry, House of Lords, and many, many others. And of course, to talk about it is Bill Leverty of Firehouse. Good day, Bill. Hey, Mitch. Thanks for having me for this episode. Ken's a great, great dude, great drummer, great producer. Yeah, you've done some work with him, in fact. With the Northern Lights Orchestra. I have, Orchestra. yeah. I've been able to play a couple of solos on the Northern Lights Orchestra recordings he's done, which uh, has been a great experience. Yeah, the, the last one was on the Ring the Bells EP. Uh, how does that work when the, I mean, you, do you all get into the same studio or do they just send tracks over or do you get to write for it or how does that come together? They had the songs written. Uh, they were great songs or this is my second time doing it with him. And, um, he sent me the, the basic backing tracks, you know, no guitar solos on there. So I laid down an intro. I laid down like an in between after the first course, before you get in the second verse melody kind of section and then the solo and then a little outro. And then I sent it back to Ken and Ken, um, he would call me back and say, Hey, you know, we can be done if you want to. He, he's just got a great way of putting it. He goes, you know, I, I'm, I'm really happy with this. But if I can push you, I would, I would encourage you to shred more. So, and that was like music to my ears because most producers are like, you know, I think you're, you're playing a little too fast in some of these sections, you know, but Ken was encouraging me to, to shred more. So that was great because... I kind of didn't get that for the longest time for with a lot of producers and and I guess just the overall uh, you know game plan you go in and trying to figure out a solo you're thinking melody and you're not thinking energy as much and so the, a lot of the energy from a solo in my opinion comes from playing fast and so he, he that's what he wanted so that was really cool and just the coolest guy to work with and his his recording and his production his playing is just top shelf. Yeah, his playing is a spot on. Now, one of the first times I heard of him was when he came back with Alice Cooper in 1986. And uh, Alice Cooper had this, you know, four, four or five years of basically just not existing as an artist. And then he came back and he did this Halloween show in uh, Michigan. And it eventually came, uh, became uh, known as the uh, Nightmare Returns uh, DVD and so. And Ken was the drummer on that. And boy, just absolutely brilliant. Here's Alice after being, you know, gone for so long, and he comes back with this killer, killer band. Uh, were you did, were you a fan of Cooper's back in the day? I was, and um, I became a, a bigger fan um, even later when you know he came out with that song Poison, and then that you know harkened me back to the older stuff, you know, because um, I guess Alice kind of backed off for a while and i kind of moved on but what an incredible band he had in that era you're speaking of when ken was a drummer and what an incredible awesome comeback i mean he, he was pretty much yeah. over and done with and then here he comes back he does this th those shows and then after that like you said poison and then uh, hey hey stupid and it just it goes on and on and then ken uh, for his part he moved on from alice cooper and and went into this 80s hair metal stuff with Gene Simmons Records and House of Lords. Um, have you ever played any shows with House of Lords? No, we never got to play with them, but I got to play with uh, some of the members yeah, of the right. band. <laughs> Chuck Wright, of course, being a uh, bass player of Quiet Riot, did many shows with him. What a, what a monster he is. And, uh, but they, they were such a great band. Yeah, they were a great band. And, and what a team they had behind them. Okay, so you got Gene Simmons from this little known band called Kiss. Then you've got Andy Johns, who's, well, you know, produced, uh, well, Led Zeppelin, <laughs> right? Uh, and then, of course, you've got Greg. Uh, now, do you say Jufria? Greg Jufria? I've always heard it as Greg Jufria, yeah. yeah. Uh, who was in Angel. Angel, yeah. What a great band. And of course, after that, their second album, after, after the first House of Lords, was an album called Sahara. And that had this song, the Blind Faith cover, Can't Find My Way Home. And for many, many people, that's the song. That's the version. It's sort of like when, uh, you know, the Beatles do Twist and Shout. You go, oh, it's the Isley Brothers. You go, no, 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 that's the Beatles. <laughs> and a lot of people feel the same way about their version of Can't Find My Way Home. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was an awesome version. And um, I mean, I, I feel like they definitely made that song their own. I mean, it, it was a, a great song back in the day when Winwood did it. But, um, you know, the, their version is just so cool. Yeah, it really is. So, um, you know, in our interview, we talk about working with Andy and Gene and, and House of Lords and all these other bands he's been with. Uh, it's a great interview. So we'll, we'll sit back and listen to that in a minute. Uh, I'll just remind the folks that this episode is brought to you by Heavy Montreal, taking place August 7th, 8th, and 9th in beautiful downtown Montreal at Parc Jean Drapeau, Corn, Slipknot, Lita Ford, uh, and a whole bunch of other bands will be there this year. And uh, I should mention I have two pairs of tickets to give away. So head over to the one on one Facebook for your chance to win two pairs of tickets or one pair of, of the two pairs for the uh, Heavy Montreal Festival. And uh, last thing I should mention is we are brought to you by the Talking Metal Digital Network. And so on that, uh, we are speaking with drummer Ken Mary, who has played with pretty much everybody, right? Uh, House of Lords, Alice Cooper, Bonfire, Tough, Accept, uh, the band I can't pronounce, Impellettery. No. Oh, my Lord. I I have a, I have a mental block with with pronouncing that band, and I apologize. And, and I spoke to Chris recently, and I had to apologize in person to Chris. So there you go. Um, let me start with. Well, let's not forget a few other ones. There's uh, Kip Wingers in there, Jordan Rudess. Yep. I also worked with the Beach Boys and Don Dockin, who you just interviewed, and Fifth Angel. Yep. And Northern Light Orchestra, Chastain. Did we miss anyone? I was on Full House for three episodes. Uh, there you go. Robin Beck. F5. Oh, with uh, uh, David Ellison? Yeah, I did, I did some recording with them and uh, and a, I think a show or two. Well, that's kind so, of cool, actually. Um, yeah, he's, he's one of my good friends, actually. He lives in Scottsdale here and a uh, great guy. Bad Moon Rising with Doug oh, Aldrich. That- that's funny. I forgot about that. <laughs> there you go, Bad Moon Rising. And you cannot forget about that because that actually is one of those lost classic albums. Anything that has Doug Aldrich on it is generally high quality. I have to agree with that, and I do have to say I'll go on record saying Doug is is one of my favorite guitar players. He's a fantastic player and yep. and uh, a fantastic just, person. Yeah, fantastic guy, fantastic player. Yeah, I really enjoyed working with him uh, in in all the different capacities that we worked together. He played on a bunch of the Northern Light Orchestra recordings as well, and just does a. He always does such an amazing job. I I can't say enough good things about Doug. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. So let let me start with House of Lords. Uh, 1988, first album came out. Great band, great album, the whole wonderful thing. Uh, tell me how about how the project came together. Well, that's actually a really good question. Uh, it was really put together by Greg Jafria and Gene Simmons, I, I believe. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, I wasn't, I was, I think I was the last guy that was actually in the band. Right. So, and I had to go through an audition process. I think Chuck and I think it might have been Lanny saw me play with Alice Cooper at Long Beach Arena and they were like, hey, we need to, we need to get this guy. Right. And so I went down and auditioned and, and one of the other drummers that auditioned was Matt Sorum. And I always joke about it that, you know, I ended up in House of Lords, he ended up in Guns N' Roses, who got the better end of that deal? And I, I think that's <laughs> kind, of a, <laughs> kind of a funny little side note there. But uh, I, w- I auditioned for it and Um, it was really put together quite quickly. Uh, the good news about that band, it was really, I will say this, it was a great album to be involved with. The players that were in that band were exceptional players. Everybody had done a tremendous amount of recording. And so it was really, uh, an easy thing to get together. We knocked out that entire first album. I think it was three weeks. I think it was about two weeks of recording. Uh, and if you listen to the vocals on that, James, I believe, did all of his lead vocals in two days, wow. which in that time period, I believe is unheard of. Like to do that level or that quality of, of vocal performance in that amount of time was was just ridiculous. And Andy Johns produced the album. It was great working with him. As you know, he yep. he produced uh, or excuse me, engineered on, I think, four of the most famous Led Zeppelin albums. I mean, 
you know, he's the engineer on Stairway to Heaven when the levee breaks, you know, Led Zeppelin IV, which is an incredible record. So that was my first time that I'd worked with Andy Johns, and I was actually a little bit nervous about it because he had fired a, a huge number of, of A-list drummers. And, you know, this is back in 1988 when there was no Pro Tools, so you either had the feel or you didn't. And, you know, the, back then you were playing to a click track, and that makes it even tougher to have quote-unquote feel. So... Um, but I got along really great with Andy. He was a wonderful guy to work with, and it was that was one of the high points as far as you know my career working with Andy. I did two records with him. We also did the second House Lords record with him. But as far as the project, how it got together, it was sort of a super group of sorts. Uh, you know, everybody had done major albums. You know, I, I came from Alice Cooper. Greg came from Angel. Chuck came from Quiet Riot. Lanny had done some work with Ozzy Osbourne and Bill Ward. Uh, so the only guy that was sort of like the unknown was James Christian. And honestly, he's just a fabulous singer. I mean, you know, you go listen to that album. I think he had one of the best rock voices, uh, period, especially during that time. So um, it, was a, it was an easy project. went together very quickly. And, it, uh, you know, honestly, it's one of my favorite records uh, that I played on. Now, was it assembled by... RCA or was it Gene Simmons that came to you and said okay I need to find five guys let's make a band or, or, or whose project exactly was it? <laughs> That's a great question uh, I, I believe the sort of like the inception of it was um, and I could be wrong but right. and I'm sure somebody will correct me if I'm wrong but it sort of started out almost as a, you know, sort of Jeffrey type project. I believe okay. David Glenn Isley sang on some of the early demos. Mm -hmm. And I believe Greg went to Gene and said, you know, he wanted to put a, a project together. And then Gene at the time was putting together a record label, as everybody knows, Simmons Records. Mm -hmm. and it, but it really was all RCA staff and RCA uh, money and, and, you know, basically all of their infrastructure was being used and Gene was kind of putting the deal together. So, um, you know, but Gene was another guy that, you know, I have nothing but good things to say about, you know, he really was a, a stand up guy and you don't meet a lot of them in the industry. You know, he did what he said he was going to do. And I think he really, you know, worked and did everything he could to make that band successful. RCA back in the day had a few rock bands, House of Lord, Pretty Boy Floyd and so on and so forth. None of them really seem to go beyond one or two albums, and, and they've been knocked as not being a good label for rock bands, that they, in fact, didn't care about rock bands, but just had them because that was, a, was on TV, on MTV, and on radio, but they didn't know what to do with those bands. What was your impression of being on RCA Records? It was a little tough, because back in that day, there was definitely a thing called leverage that was used. And I've talked about this a little bit before, but, you know, let's say you have Def Leppard on your roster and then you have House of Lords and you're trying to break a new artist. You can do a lot of things if you have Def Leppard on your, on your label. You can go to the record stores and say, hey, the new Def Leppard's coming out. I want you to take 10 House of Lords for each store. And then when Def Leppard comes through, we'll give you backstage passes and we'll give you you know, access to the band for interviews and blah, blah, blah. So you can use a lot of that uh, force of having that uh, major band on your label to help break your new artists. Unfortunately, with RCA at the time, they really didn't have, you're correct, they really didn't have any rock artists that were um, just m a massive entity in the business. And that made it definitely a lot more challenging for us because I know that at, at a certain point, they were trying to break their newer rock artists using us as leverage and we were still working to establish ourselves. And, and, you know, we were looking at that going, you know, that's really not the best scenario to be in. The best scenario is, you know, let's say they've got, you know, Whitesnake or some, some band that was massive at the time. And you go like, okay, now we're utilizing that leverage and we're using that leverage at radio and at retail. Because, again, back then, uh, brick and mortar stores were really important. If you weren't in the record stores, then you were going to have a big problem. And, and I talked about this previously but we would go on tour and and we'd be playing you know in a stadium situation and we'd make random uh, phone calls to record stores and find out that they didn't have the record in stock which was you know mind-boggling uh, in those days 
It's kind of mind-boggling. I mean, you know, if I, I hate to blame a label because everybody, all artists always blame their label, but I will say this. You know, we've had people that were at Geffen and, and people that were at different companies come up to us and say, you know, if you guys would have been on our label with the hits that you guys had and everything you guys had going on, you would have sold, you know, 10 million albums. So, right. you know, when you hear that from other industry people, you kind of go like, was it RCA's fault that, you know, we weren't massive? And I say, well, you know, kind of. I mean, we certainly had everything going on. The band was incredible live. We had great tours that we were on. And I, th I think we really put out some great records. And we had a, you know, a decent amount of success. I'm not saying we weren't successful, but I'm, I, I will say that we weren't as successful as we would have all liked to have been. Right. And, and, and a quick correction. Pretty Boy Floyd was on MCA, not uh, RCA. Jeez. Well, <laughs> at the time, that's just about saying the same thing, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, isn't it, though, right? Because... Uh... It was just yeah, MCA had the same problem. They really weren't a rock label, and you know it was the same thing over there. I mean, they had a really difficult time with rock acts. I think if you were on RCA or MCA at that time period and you were a rock band, you were, you were going to have some level of, of uh, problem with, with uh, getting your records in the stores. It, and it's strange that those labels, because they were successful labels, just couldn't figure out the pulse of that one scene they could figure out whatever dance music or whatever else they were doing they couldn't figure out the rock stuff and and there was so much of it going on right um i, I, yeah. I think so and i think honestly it comes down to the to the machinery of your company a lot of times a company is set up based on certain acts like everybody knows that a record company's value is really based on the bands that they have and so if your biggest bands on your label are pop that's going to reflect the entire rest of your company and it's it's pretty much the same thing with labels at the time like MCA and RCA they just weren't rock labels and and the the infrastructure and their connections at radio their connections at retail just didn't reflect that yeah now the second album Sahara, a mm -hmm. um, lot of guests on there, uh, Rick Nielsen at Cheap Trick, Doug Aldridge, but of course he wasn't a known commodity really back at the time, uh, Chris from the band that I can't pronounce, Impolitary. there you go, <laughs> uh, White Lions, Mike Tramp, who had had great success up at that point, Robin Zander, uh, Ron Keel, and many, many more, and of course it gives, gives us your biggest uh, single, in my opinion, Can't Find My Way Home, which is the uh, Blind Faith cover. Tell without me a little a about, doubt. pardon me? I said, yeah, without a doubt. That, yeah. was a, that was a huge success. And I really think that, you know, Stevie Winwood and Blind Faith fans are not going to like this, but I, I really think you made the ultimate version of that song. I really prefer your version to any other version, and that's... I certainly appreciate you saying that, and, and in all humility, you know, it's always tough when you're doing a classic song, and I think that if you're doing a song that's from an era that people really attach to, and, it's, and it was their time growing up, you know, in their minds, it's sacrilege that you redid the song. And then, of right. course, for the new fans that never heard of the old version, they're going like, hey, they just love it because it's a great song. Right. And so for us, you know, we just felt like it was a great song. We did a demo. Uh, and here there's a funny story behind that song because that's the actual 12 track demo that we did in our rehearsal room and it was a, a, an Akai 12 track back in the day. These things recorded on what looked like a video cassette. Right. And uh, we had done everything, uh, including the drums, everything on this 12 track demo and when we went into the 32 track digital studio for whatever reason we couldn't capture the same magic and we all knew that we captured something magical on that demo so what we did is we took the 12 track we dumped it to the 32 track digital and then we redid the drums and the bass and mixed that song and so I guess the funny story behind that and for all your listeners that that care and love that song that is actually just a revised version of our demo that and wow. and again we just we just knew that something happened. When we turned that demo in, even to the label, everybody was kind of freaking out. They're going, wow, this is, this is just incredible. And, and there was something that James captured in his vocal performance that he, he, I don't think he was able to recapture. It was just sort of magical. His voice was kind of worn out that day, and, mm -hmm. and he was a little tired and having to struggle a little bit. And, and that kind of gave that emotion that you know, that song has. And you go listen to it, and it's just a... You know, I have to agree with you in terms of, you know, that was a, 
probably our best song and just best vibe, best, you know, the kind of the pinnacle of House of Lords. I think that was a, a really great example of, you know, what the band was. What, how do you look back on Sahara? Is it a good album? Is it an album that, that could have been better? Because uh, I'm looking at this chart position. It, it hit number 121 on Billboard, which is respectable. But, but of course, back in the day, rock was hot. It probably should have been at least top 40. Uh, you had all these great talents on it. Sort of what went right and what went wrong on Sahara? Well, I'm not sure where that chart position comes from. I think it went a lot higher than that. For some reason, I noticed that a lot of times on all music, they're saying the chart position was, right. was A or B, and it's totally wrong. Okay. Um, so I, I think that album went much, much higher than that. I do know it was in the top 100, uh, and I think the sales on it were actually quite good, especially worldwide. So, okay. um, you know, just to clear that up, you know, I, I do not believe that information is even remotely correct. I'm sorry, what was the, well, what was the question well, again? And I'll, I'll be perfectly frank, uh, you know, I don't have the Billboard charts from 1991 lying around, so, I, so I'm, so I'm sure. using facts from the internet, and sure. as we know... Well, we all know that everything on the internet's 100% true. Exactly, so. so I must be right, and you know, I'm kidding. Uh, so listen, uh, it could have, of course, got a lot higher than 121, and unfortunately... You know, uh, 20 years on, I don't have the original billboard in front of me. No problem, no problem. I was just pointing that out. but, but uh, Which is fair, which is fair, and hopefully that'll get uh, sorted out and corrected. But the, the question is then, or was, uh, what went right on the album? I mean, what do you like about it? And in sense, what went wrong? Why didn't it hit number one? Why wasn't it number eight? Why wasn't it, you know, top 20? Sure. Well, I, honestly, I, I have to go back to the label at that point because I do think that we had the hits on there. We had Remember My Name, which was a top 10 MTV video. Mm -hmm. We had Can't Find My Way Home, which was, I think, another top 10 video on MTV. We had, um, I think there was another couple of singles off that that did fairly well. So, I, you know, if you look at the, the momentum we had going, I, I really can't tell you why sales weren't as good as they were. I will tell you this. Uh, my opinion is... Um, that particular album, you know, the band had really turned into a band at that point. And, and what you had in regards to the songs on that album were really, you know, five guys sitting in a rehearsal room with a, a, an Akai 12 track and, and the ability to record things and listen back and see what's working and see what's not working and doing it, you know, the old fashioned way where you just go through a bunch of songs, you find the best songs, you put it on the record, you demo them up, you turn it into the label, you turn it into Gene, you turn it into your management, you know, you give it to everybody, everybody sits around and goes, yes, these are the best songs and we all kind of collectively agree on these things. So I think that that album to me, uh, was a lot stronger record. I think that was definitely the peak of House of Lords. Um, and I look back on, on that record with a lot of fond memories. I, I, think, it was, I think it was clearly our best record. Um, and I think the, the reason for that is that it really was made as a band as opposed to the first album was great too, don't get me wrong. I, like, I think the first album for what it, for what it is, is is truly amazing. But we weren't, you know, five guys sitting around in a room that had toured together and had worked together and had sweated together. And, and you know, once you do all those things, I think it just makes for much better art. Right. And then, of course, after that album came out, at some point you decide, OK, I need to move on. Why was that decision made that you figured I've done two albums? I'm done. Well, for me there were just some strange things going on from a business standpoint gotcha. uh, in that situation. And I don't want to really get too specific. I will tell you Fair it's enough. not Gene. <laughs> okay. For, for those people that might think it's Gene, Gene was always the very honest man. I have nothing but good things to say about him. Uh, you know, he's obviously a very good businessman. I never had any problems with Gene, but there were some, uh, some other entities uh, where there were some, just some odd things going on and I didn't really see that it was going to get better and I was pretty much at a point where you know I'd been on the road between Alice House of Lords bands like Randy Hansen uh, I think I'd been on the, on tour for more or less 7 years at that point and I was just like you know I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of done with this and so I made a decision to to walk away 
And some people thought, you know, oh, that was, you know, a little premature. But as it turned out, we all know what happened in, in 92 when Nirvana came out. So right. um, it actually kind of worked out just fine for me. And, and I feel like I left at the exact right time uh, because the next album that came out after that, I think, is exactly the type of album. And I'm not going to, you know, slag anybody here because I, I think for what, you know, for what they were doing, you know, it turned out fine, but was it five guys that had toured and sweat together and worked together? You know, it sounds a little bit like, you know, we got some demos together and we made an album and, and that's not, that's not uh, a slag on anybody or the producer or anything like that. It's just, it's just the difference, just like I was saying between the first House of Lords album and the second House of Lords album, right. when it's a real band you can tell, and I think people can tell. I think there's that that element of just being genuine, and uh, it's something real that people can sense in the music, and and that's something that I think, you know, and later on, and I I just you know I didn't hear that same thing. So at any point, that's that's pretty much you know my reason for leaving. But but as it turns out, you know, I think it was it was a it was a good time to step away. Yeah, it was the right choice. Now let's. Let's talk Alice Cooper. Now, if we go to the internet, of course, and we go to Wikipedia, it says that you played on his 1986 Constrictor album. That, of course, is not true. You played on the tour. That is that is true. I did play on the tour. Now, I'd like to also add that I was also not involved in the 1969 <laughs> landing on the moon. I was in no way... That's right. That's on the I Wikipedia not page on as well. So I just want to clear that up because I've been having a lot of, of uh, emails about that too. <laughs> just now, kidding. as far as Constrictor, um, that was supposedly mostly drum machines on there. But but how did, how did Alice Cooper uh, get in touch with you? How did the camp, whether it's uh, Shemp or, or whoever, uh, get you on the tour? And when the offer was made, you know, Alice at that time had pretty much disappeared from the scene for a good four or five years. His career, when he stopped in 80, 81, was, you know, he, he was really knocking on death's door. He didn't look healthy, the whole thing. What made you decide, okay, let me try this. Let's see what happens. And how were you contacted? Well, it's it's an interesting story. I was actually playing the Whiskey A Go Go with an artist named Randy Hansen, who's a, a very famous guitarist from Seattle. And there were some people from Alice's management that were down there, and they saw me play with Randy, and they they said, "Hey, you know, would you like to come down and audition for Alice Cooper?" And at the time, you know, I was really young, and I said, "Well, hey, you know, are you going to fly me down? You know, because I live up in Seattle." And they said, "Well, you know, we." We can't fly anybody in, but, you know, if you'd like to come down and audition, you know, we'd love to have you. So I went down. I guess they had four days of auditions. I was on day number two. Right. And I went in, and I learned the material forwards and backwards and sideways, and I was super prepared for the audition. And I went in, and we we played almost nothing from all the material that I had learned. We basically jammed. Right. And it was Kane Roberts and Kip Winger and myself, and I, I want to say Randy from Wasp was in the band at that point. Okay. And, and uh, Kane looked at me when we were done, and he said, well, I'd like to say you have the gig. I can't even imagine somebody coming in here and doing any better than that. And, you know, that was amazing, but, you know, we have two more days of auditions that we have to go through, and, you know, so I was kind of sitting on pins and needles, but then I got the call, and, and uh, you know, it was really – you know, a magical time because, you know, you say Alice was gone and his career was, you know, not doing well at that point. But I think, you know, there was a real sense throughout the, I think just everybody knew like what he was going to do next was going to be big. I mean, I don't know how you knew it, but like, w like when I saw Man Behind the Mask, I wasn't in the band yet. And, and like, for some reason, just seeing Alice Cooper was exciting. And, I, and I'm not sure why, why that happens with certain artists at certain times, and not at other times, but I just know that that was really, that was a time that was kind of like his time, and you knew it was going to be big, and honestly, we didn't know how big it was going to be. I mean, it ended up being a lot bigger than, than we even thought it was, and, and, and I, I, I tell the story of, you know, before touring with Alice, the biggest place I had played was probably about 5,000, well, probably three to 5,000 seats. 
you know, I'd played places like the Paramount in Seattle. And when I'd been on tour with Randy, we'd played small theaters, you know, from a thousand to 2000 seats and, and sold out some of those. So I had played some, some fairly large shows, but nothing compared to, you know, what we were going to be playing with Alice, which was, I think our fifth show was, um, Joe Lewis arena in Detroit sold out 22,000 people broadcast live on MTV in front of millions more. So it was, it was one of those crazy things where it was just a monster tour and we were playing sold out Coliseums for pretty much the entire tour worldwide. So, um, when you say, you know, his career wasn't doing well, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, you know, it had not done well to that point, but I think there was, there was definitely a kind of a, you know, people missed him. People, you know, wanted to go see him again. And there was a real curiosity. There was a whole generation of, of people coming up that had never seen him. So I think there was a real energy around that time period uh, where, where you just knew it was going to, it was going to be a good tour. How, if you can recall, was Alice in terms of, did he have a sense of purpose? Was he, was he just nervous? Like, oh my God, I haven't done this in five years. Are people still going to want to see? What was sort of his demeanor or his, um, you know, state of mind going into those shows? Because that MTV show was really sort of the fifth show of a five-year layoff. And that's a pretty <laughs> impressive audience to go in front of millions, like you said, on your fifth show back after a five-year break. Oh, Absolutely. And, and, well, what I like to say is, you know, I never actually met him. Right. Uh, I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> um, as, as far as his mindset, you know, this is what I'll say about Alice, um, you know, because obviously some of his mindset, you'd probably have to talk to him. I, I couldn't really speak to his mindset, but I will say this. Alice is a total professional. Agreed. And, um, you know, he, he's one of those guys that just to give you a for instance, you know, there's earlier tours, you know, I wasn't on these earlier tours, you know, in the 70s, but I know that at one point he had fallen off the stage and broken his ribs and finished out the tour. Now, it is incredibly painful to sing with broken ribs, mm -hmm. but, you know, but that's, the, you know, Alice is that kind of performer. And the other thing that I'll say too about him, his voice as he goes on in a tour gets stronger and stronger and stronger, which is the total opposite of most singers. Most singers, as they go on the tour, they get a little weaker and weaker and weaker, and he just gets stronger and stronger. So, you know, he's a total pro. Um, I think the only nervousness that I would sense from him, um, and this is what I was told, you know, this is what I had heard. So, again, you'd probably have to speak to him about it. But, you know, from what I understand, these were the first shows he had done uh, where he had, you know, it's, it's well documented, obviously, that he had problems with drugs and alcohol. Right. And, and I believe these were the first shows he had done sober. Absolutely. And so, so from that perspective, I think, I think it was a little bit, uh, you know, that was something different for him that he, he obviously had to get used to. Um, but I think he just did a, an incredible job and, and, you know, you go back and, and watch that show and you think, yeah, that's a lot, <laughs> that's a lot of pressure to be under. Yeah. And, you know, they, they've released a DVD since there, the nightmare returns. Um, if anybody hasn't picked it up, I certainly encourage you to go to Amazon or one of those places. Cause it, it really just is a great, 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 uh, piece of work and, and everybody, the band is tight. The whole thing is fantastic. Um, raise your fist and yell. Can you there? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, raise your fist and yell. Uh, the album came out in 1987 on, uh, my mom's birthday of all things. What is the process going in? Does Alice come to you and say, uh, here are the drum parts, just play them. Does he involve you in the creative process? Do they say, okay, listen, uh, Poison, Bon Jovi, Def Leppard, and all these bands are exploding. We need to sound like them. Uh, what was sort of the, the, the creative raison d'etre of raise your fist and yell? Well, I will say, yeah, that, that was, it was nothing like that. You know, never at any point did somebody sit us down and say, Hey, we want to sound like this or we want to do this. I think at that, at that point, you know, it's just like what we were talking about with house of Lords where, you know, once you've toured together and, you know, we had toured together for, you know, a year at that point. So, 
So we all knew each other's playing very well. And I think, um, you know, Kane and Alice worked out the songs. So the songs were kind of worked up. And then Kane would work on the arrangements and the parts with, with Kip and I. But as far as the drums, uh, it really was one of those things where, you know, hey, w- you know, what works, what fits. And, you know, I was, uh, Michael Wagner was the producer. And I think there was a high level of respect that everybody had for each other to where, you know, really nobody got in anybody else's space. You know, like if, you know, nobody got in Michael Wagner's space, nobody got in Kane's space, nobody got in my space. I think everybody just did what they felt was the best for the music right. and for the songs. And I think, I think it's a really great album, actually. Uh, yeah. There's a couple things I would go back and change, but in terms of the playing on that album, I think there's some, some real phenomenal playing on that record. Yeah. Uh, you know, songs like Freedom and stuff like that are, are great, great songs. Uh, how, well, how do you look back on your Alice Cooper days? Uh, do you wish you could have done more? Are you proud of what you've done? Uh, uh, absolutely. If, yeah. I, I am proud of, of the fact that I, I toured with Alice and, and, you know, I toured with him for two world tours and, and, you know, he's a, he's a fantastic guy. You know, I always say this in all, any interview that I do where they ask me, but it, it's true. I mean, he's a, he's just a, he's a very intelligent man, but he's a very humble man and he's a very nice person. You know, he's a, he's a great person to be around. And if, if you, you know, if you eat, I mean, just watch some of his interviews and you really get a sense of who he is. He's just like a really great guy that you, you can't say anything bad about him. And, and, and I won't ever say anything bad about him. I really, if I look back on my times touring with Alice, I will say it was probably the most enjoyable time of my career. And here's why. Um, as you, as you get older and it becomes, you know, you're, it's, it's a band that you're in, like it's House of Lords, you're a member, you own it. You know, all of a sudden you're concerned about how much are we paying the bus driver? Where's the record on the charts? Uh, you know, how much are we paying the road crew? How much is the manager taking? You know, are we going to get paid this month? You know, like all of these different things when it's your own band, it's, it's a, a whole different level of attentiveness and care and and it's just a lot more emotional involvement the great thing about working with Alice um, and I didn't realize it at the time perhaps but you know I look back on those times I, that was the most fun I ever had was <laughs> touring with Alice because I didn't have to think about any of those things Shep was a you know straight up guy uh, another awesome person uh, totally honest never had to worry about getting ripped off or anything like yep. that I mean just a just a great guy, great manager, a great organization to work with. Totally professional. Um, you know, I look back on those those times with with a lot of fond memories. There, you know, there are a couple people that were in that organization that were a little. You know, people always go, "Well, why did you leave?" And I always say, "Well, you know, there's some people that were within the organization, not Alice and not Shep, but some other people that kind of made it clear that you know, hey, this isn't your band, and you know that kind of thing. And you kind of have the sense that, well. If you're going to really be successful, you're going to have to step out and do your own thing at some point, which is why, you know, Kip Winger went on to do Winger and I went on to do House of Lords and Kane did his solo albums. And, you know, it's one of those things where you understand that at some point the, the eagle has to leave the nest. Yep. But I will say that in retrospect, the most fun I had, uh, probably because it was, you know, brand new, was that first Alice tour was the most fun for me. And that was the most fun I believe I had touring just because. There was no stress. It was totally professional. I trusted everybody involved, and and it was a it was really a fun time. I, I can imagine. Now, um, you know, I could go on forever and ever because you've got such a long history and pedigree. But let me let me end with this tonight. Um, except Stephen Kaufman gets injured. The band is on tour. And they call you in. Now, I'm, I'm assuming this is going to be a story that's a little bit different than the Alice Cooper. They've got a new singer, David Reese. It's the Eat the Heat tour. <laughs> After you're done uh, the U.S. tour, or by the end of it, the band decides, we've had enough. They throw everybody out. Band breaks up, essentially. Um, and I interviewed David recently, and he said that you were absolutely a breath of fresh air they told you to learn five songs you had learned like 30 and they had never seen anything like that before Uh, tell me a little bit about that experience and and what it was like working in what i guess was somewhat a dysfunctional moment in that band's history 
Well, that's a long, yeah, that's a, that's a huge question there. Um, it, uh, you know, from what I saw, you know, I was a little bit behind the scenes and I was so concerned about doing what I had to do, which was exactly what you're talking about. I had to learn a ton of songs, mm-hmm. um, which was not easy because, you know, Stephen left fairly quickly. And I, and I want to say I had, I, I think I had, you know, maybe a rehearsal with the band and we're jumping on stage and playing these songs. So it was it was a lot to absorb in a super short amount of time, and you know as it worked out, it worked out just fine. But um, I will I will say that you know everybody there too you know is was a pro. I mean obviously there was some internal strife going on, and there were some guys that weren't getting along, which I didn't really know about. All I know is that you know we went on and we I thought we did really good shows, and then about. Um, and here's a here's a funny phone call. You know, I get a phone call from the road manager, and he and he tells me, "Hey Ken, here's your this is this is like we're midway through the tour, and you got to remember my experience, especially with Alice in House of Lords, is unless you're dead, you're going to play the show, right? And the tour goes on. You know, I'll I'll give you an example with Alice. There's one time I had food poisoning. I had a fever of 103. I don't even remember the show. I just remember my 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 uh, roadie pushed me up onto the stage. You know, we played the whole show. I did a drum solo and everything. Everybody says I played amazing. I don't even remember it. And then I, I run off. You know, I came off stage. They wrapped me in a jacket and took me back to the hotel. Right. And you know, the, the, you just don't cancel shows. You don't cancel tours. You know, no matter what, unless you're dead, the show goes on. Right. And that that was how I was trained. And. And all of a sudden, the road manager calls me in the middle of the accept tour and says, hey, your flight home tomorrow is this and that. And I started laughing. I, w- I went, you're joking, right? And I go, we have another like month and a half left. And he's like, no, we don't. And I, and I, and I was like, okay, well, well, what happened? And he goes, well, a few of the guys are just not getting along here and they're calling it quits. And I was, I was really shocked and surprised. Uh, but I will say that, you know, I have friends in that band to this day, you know, Peter Baltes is a really good friend of mine, the bass player and Wolf's a friend of mine and David Reese. I haven't talked to in a long time, but I have no, you know, no ill feelings toward uh, David. You know, I I know that there were some issues going on between some of the members, but you know, between myself and all those guys, I got along well with everybody. So there is one funny story I can tell you. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) If if you have time for it, here's here's a great, a lot of time for fun stories. Well, maybe not. Maybe fun is the wrong way to describe it. But I will tell you that uh, when I was on tour with Accept in Cincinnati, uh, the guitar player and I were going to to do our laundry at a laundromat. Don't ask me why. We were at a hotel. The they were kind of rude. They wouldn't do our. You know, we usually tried to pay off the maids and have them do our laundry for us. For some reason, they wouldn't do that at this hotel. So we're we're taking a taxi to a laundromat, and we're on our way back. And the taxi cab driver is looking in the mirror and he goes, we're getting pulled over by the police. That's really odd. And we said, you know, I thought, well, maybe he ran a red light or something. Then he goes, and the, and, and he's coming to the car and he has his gun drawn. <laughs> oh, good. And nice. Going, uh, this doesn't sound very good to me. So anyways, you know, we have guns pulled on us. We're, we're asked to get out of the cab. We're put in the back of a police car. And all of a sudden, you know, five other cars show up and then there's some undercover police officers going through our laundry and all of this stuff. It turns out there was a rape and robbery, um, you know, about a block from where we were apparently, and we fit the description. So somebody came up and looked at us and said, yeah, that's not them. And, you know, they let us go and everything, but it was, it was like, Hey, welcome to Cincinnati. Wow. Well, that, that would have been a, uh, an unglamorous way to finish that tour or finish that, that event. But, um, <laughs> Uh, just I'll ask you quickly about Wolf Hoffman because you've played with some incredible guitarists. I've always thought that he's one of these unsung guitar gods that, you know, you you walk into a record store or whatever, you'd see a poster of Eddie Van Halen or you see a poster of, you know, Jimi Hendrix or whatever. And people just sort of seem to forget about Wolf. Um, what are your impressions of Wolf as a guitarist? I think he's a great player. And I think I think maybe the reason... Uh, that that happens where you'll see an Eddie Van Halen versus a, a Wolf poster. as a, Just the fact that I think he goes a little bit more for the melodic and right. maybe not, not the super shredder speed kind of things that, that maybe, you know, back in that era were really the, the type of guitar players that got the attention. So I think, I think he's a super tasteful player. 
you know, obviously they're, you know, they're having, I don't know if you know this, but they're having tremendous success in Europe right now. I mean, oh, yeah, huge absolutely. success. And they're doing really great. So, um, you know, my impression of Wolf is he's a great player. Same with Peter. These guys are, you know, I just saw him at the NAM show. We were all out at NAM in, in January and we had breakfast together. They're super nice guys. You know, again, lifelong friends. You know, most, most of the people that I've met in the business, I've been very blessed and fortunate to meet guys that are just really great guys and, you know, you'd want to be friends with. And I know that that doesn't happen all the time, but um, in my personal experience, that's really the way it's been. But, yeah, I think he's a great player and, uh, and, and uh, you know, again, hate to keep saying it, but one of those guys that you just go, you know, super nice guy, really funny too, which is kind of odd. You know, normally, you know, people that, uh, at least from Germany will tell you, you know, when I'm in Germany, they'll tell you, well, we don't really have a sense of humor over here. And so you don't necessarily think of, of people that are from Germany as having a good sense of humor, but Wolf and Peter and Michael Wagner, you know, these guys have tremendous senses of humor too. So I really got along well with those guys. Yeah, no, I, I love the Accept guys, actually. Great, great band. Um, Sonic Fish is your studio, and Sonic Fish, uh, P-H-I-S-H, by the way, dot com is where people can find you. Is there anything that you would like to say or plug uh, before we wrap this one up? Well, sure. Um, actually, I'm, I'm involved in the new movie that's going to be coming out probably in the next... It's probably going to be... 10 months or so before we finish the uh, the production on it, but it's called the Drumming Hall of Fame. And I started a, a drum page on Facebook. So if anybody wants to hit me up at Ken K. Mary, it's the drummer official site on Facebook. Um, that's, I, that's something I've started recently. Um, I talked about it in, a little bit in some interviews, but I, I've been getting back a lot more into playing as of late. Yeah. And and uh, really excited about playing drums because the first time in a, in a number of years I can do it without having a lot of pain. And this is something we really didn't talk about, but but at any rate, um, yeah, if somebody wants to find out more about that kind of information, they can just go to the uh, the uh, website there and and check that out. But that's that's a movie that's going to be coming out. I'm really excited. We've we've done interviews with guys like Steve Gadd. Nice. Uh, Simon Phillips, you know, guys that you look at and have been, you know, almost, I would, I would say not almost, but are legendary in the drumming community. These are guys that mm -hmm. are some of the most recorded drummers in history. So uh, it's really been an honor. I was asked to, to host the show and, and it's really been, you know, again, a lot of fun and it's been fun for me to get back to what really is my first love, which is drumming. But as far as, you know, the production side, yeah, sonicfish.com. That's another place that people can find out what's going on, and I certainly appreciate the interview, Mitch. Yeah, and well, I'll just ask you quickly, what were the injuries that were preventing you from playing? Well, I, I started to have some pretty bad back problems, you know, really after I had left House of Lords, and uh, when I say severe, I'm talking about like, you know, where it's an injury. I, I'd been in car accidents when I was young, and they really didn't, you know how that happens where it just doesn't show up till years later? Yep. It was one of, the, one of those kinds of things. I was in some pretty serious accidents, and I, I had some lower back problems that, that really were making it difficult for me to play without pain, and I was able to basically overcome that with some, some new equipment and some physical therapy, and, uh, you know, I'm able to play a lot more. Uh, like, now I can play every day without having any type of pain, which is really kind of a new thing. I was sort of limiting my involvement to recording and studio work, you know, and occasionally playing a, a show here and there and uh, and just leaving it at that. But but I am excited to, to actually be playing again and, and having some fun with it. Oh, that's great to hear because, you know, I've actually enjoyed your playing on, on many, many, many albums. Uh, the Bad Moon Rising, the House of Lords stuff, the Alice Cooper stuff. Um, you know, it's just great, great stuff. So, Great pleasure speaking with you, and uh, I look forward to, to, to the movie and to anything else that you might uh, be up to. Great. Thanks so much, Mitch. Thank you, Ken. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. There you have it, folks, my interview with Ken Mary, drummer extraordinaire. Again, Alice Cooper, House of Lords, and many, many other projects. This episode brought to you by the Heavy Montreal Festival, taking place August 7th, 8th, and 9th in Beautiful downtown Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Slipknot, Faith No More, Extreme, Dokken, and many others will be part of the festival this year. And for your chance to win a pair of tickets, head over to the one-on-one -on -one Facebook page. You have a chance to win one of two pairs. Bill, always a pleasure having you along. Um, 
Hey, always a pleasure to be here, Mitch. Thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah, and of course, we'll remind the folks to head over to Leverty.com for all your Bill Leverty needs. Uh, and I think there's a lot of stuff people need on that. Uh, there's the um, uh, what a little strong single, Flood the Engine, right? Yeah, and then, you know, Firehouse is touring this summer, yep. so hopefully in a town near you. Yeah, yeah. Top Firehouse needs to go on a, a, a permanent uh, 200 uh, show tour. What do you think? Oh, I'm I'm down. I'm <laughs> down for that. Right. Well, uh, we'll start you in March and run you all the way through January of the year after. I vote yes. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, it certainly would be great. Uh, any any uh, developments in Firehouse music? Any, well, any... we're uh, you know we're we're touring a lot this summer, and then we're we're going to plan on uh, putting together a song here as soon as possible. So uh, we're bouncing some ideas around. So that's that's where we are on that. So looking forward to getting that going. Yeah, and you've got Voyageur Days coming up in Mattawa, Ontario, with Bad Company's uh, Paul Rogers, which I think will be a kick-ass evening. Uh, always a lot of fun, right? With uh, when you get to hear Shooting Star done live. Oh, they're awesome. Yeah, we've done a show with them before, and we've done a show with Paul Rogers before, too. So it's a, for me, it's a great education to be able to uh, you know, go up there, not only to, to be able to play and, and, and have a great time playing, but to uh, kick back and watch guys like Paul Rogers uh, you know, say, you know, this is why I'm the greatest singer in the world. <laughs> you know? yeah, and he doesn't say that, but I do. And as far as I know, he's moved to Canada, as far as I know. I think he's a Canadian now. That's what I hear. Yeah, and yeah. Um, how lucky you guys are to have him up there, man. That's that's just awesome. I'd I'd like to hear him sing every night. Ah, well, hey, maybe maybe if we all move out to Vancouver, we could probably see him at a karaoke bar every 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 Tuesday yeah. or something. There you go. Uh, and there you go. And so that that was it with Ken Mary. I gotta say, um, great interview, by the way. Uh, Ken, very candid, lots of great stories, and uh, you know, go back and check out those albums and and songs that were mentioned during the interview because. Uh, You'll really get a chance to hear a master drummer at work. And I gotta say, he's a master producer as well and a master mix engineer. So if you just check out those Northern Light Lights Orchestra uh, recordings, and and you'll hear uh, his his work in that regard as well. He he is really really good. Yeah. There you go, Bill. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Have a good. Have one. a great one. See you. There you go. Can't go without that. Yeah. <laughs>